Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Endzone Focus. I'm Davina William. Our guest on this week's program was born in India and emigrated to New Zealand in the 1950s when he was 12 years old. He has become one of this country's greatest philanthropists, donating millions of dollars to worthy causes. And in fact, his donation to the University of Auckland to build its business school is believed to be the largest donation in New Zealand educational history. Five days after Canterbury's devastating quake in 2011, he gave $1 million to the earthquake fund. More recently, he's vowed to give one-tenth of his $800 million fortune to projects aimed at ending child abuse and family violence in New Zealand. He's also launched his own inquiry into the causes of domestic violence in this country. It's probably not surprising then that he was knighted in this year's New Year's Honours list. He is, of course, Sir Owen Glenn, and he joins Alan Lee. Sir Owen, welcome to the programme. Thank you so much for joining us. You're in the top 20 of the NBR Rich List. You've won numerous awards because of your success in business. You've been given the highest award of the Lepcha people of North East India, chiefly status conferred on you on Fiji. Now you're a knight here in New Zealand. That's not bad for a Mount Roskill Grammar School boy who left school at 15 and lived in a state house, is it? You actually missed a few, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I sort of wondering the other day, I have most of this memorabilia on a wall on my home in Sydney and Double Bay, and I've actually uh, talked to the business school to transfer all this, because they, they did a painting of me years ago, which is, you know, it wasn't my idea, believe me. But I like the painting because it sort of scowls at the students. <laughs> have you done your homework? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, when you when you left school at fifteen, did did you think? Oh come did, on! <laughs> well, no, obviously. <laughs> but I mean, did you did were you ambitious as a as a boy? No. Well, I was just happy to get a job. i I was single. I was playing. Hockey was my chosen sport at that time, and I had a healthy uh, regard for the female race. <laughs> Uh, like any normal old <laughs> talent, <laughs> you know, I wasn't doing anything naughty. I didn't get arrested for anything. I because I was rather boring in Hard a work. way. But things rapidly changed and improved. Yeah. Why have you poured so much of your philanthropy into New Zealand? Because you know, it's well, pretty hard to spend all that money. <laughs> that's a, that's a glib answer. Um, well, I, as I think I've been known to say I, in, in my formative years when I had got married, first married, I had nothing and I got a state house and they gave me one in Otara, semi-detached house. And I still saw how people lived there and I didn't like it so I moved to Australia and I landed there with about $68, you know, and two kids, <laughs> one, the last one came later. So wow, what else does one do but work, you know, and uh, yeah. I remember what I saw, and when I came back, and for some reason things came my way, people sent me things to read, and, and I, I saw this terrifying uh, statistic of domestic violence and child abuse. And uh, to think that New Zealand, you know, one of the, in my mind, uh, top three countries in the world to live in, that had this growing cancer in society with no uh, attempt, in my mind, or ability to stop and reverse the process. Um, and it's a remarkable similarity to places I, other places I do f uh, philanthropic work in China and India. You know, and here we are, a developed, so-called developed society. And uh, there seems to be two New Zealands, mm. you know. And, um, and you're conscious of, I mean, we, we obviously cover all sorts of stories. And we always seem very conscious that, that there is a widening gulf mm. between that the well-off in New Zealand and those who aren't. That's well, I often quote, you know, people drive on the southern motorway, they accelerate past the Tara. Mm. They don't stop. And, you know, and the, and the, the migration of, of unemployed youth, for instance, uh, from country to urban areas are establishing what I would call ghettos. Mm. Now, they're not ghettos in the style of Warsaw, but they're ghettos they're where people are congregating and uh, learning to exist with poverty and all the trappings that it brings. And, hey, you know, something's happened to the loss of family values in our Maori and Pacifica societies, 
and the inability to bridge to Christian values, uh, largely in, in, in mm. Pākehā society. And yet, a lot of the Māori and Pākehā are devout people. Uh, may not be Catholic or Anglican, could be Methodist or whatever. Um, but it's something has gone wrong in the process, and then government stepped in and handed out benefits left, right and centre to everybody that puts their hand out, and then people have forgot what it's like to work for a living. But where do they find work? Mm. You set up the Glen Inquiry into, into mm. domestic violence and, and child abuse. In many ways, that's a, that's a government job, isn't it? And, and yet you've taken it Well, it has it been a government job, government job, should have been a government job forever, let alone mm. the last four or five decades. But you look at the statistics on the one hand and you, you uh, have the belief in another, where does the twain meet? You know, what, is, what has gone wrong? What isn't working? Something's not working. So you set it up. Um, what do you hope you can achieve that, that, that other initiatives haven't achieved? Well, we are requesting all the reports that have been done, officially done, and paid for by public money over a long period of time. Um, we've discovered some were buried and not published or saw the air. Uh, we'll be subpoenaing those. Um, so, you know, we, as we say, this is a people's inquiry, and this is ground up, and we have a right to know, mm. and we will exercise that right, and we'll ask people to exercise that right. We put up a website. We hope to attract not less than half a million people to sign in, if not closer to a million or more. And um, we were at Waitangi at, uh, over the last two days, three days, whatever, and there was a huge response. Hundreds of people came up and registered and said, we'd like to tell our story. Mm. The main things are privacy and protection. Some of the stories are absolutely unbelievable almost. Is that what drives you, you hearing those, oh, those stories? Uh, well, I've struck it in other places. India's not exactly mm. uh, fairyland. I mean, the children and women that I rescue from domestic slavery and, and uh, prostitution and worse. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's an epidemic that's growing and growing. So I hope we'll come up here with some sort of a blueprint that'll point the way and say, well, you know, we went through the discovery process. Now we are working on what we need to do, the crusader section of it, in my opinion. And then thirdly, as I said in an interview in Waitangi, that uh, I believe this is a mission from God. That we, uh, I don't know why he entered my mind and said, stop sitting around doing nothing. <laughs> Get on with it, Glenn. <laughs> Hard to refuse that one, isn't it? Yeah, well, I tell you, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm interested that you, you. I mean, you talked about the research that that you know hadn't been been made public. Uh, I mean, it sounds like like there has been research, but for for reasons yeah, that it's we been don't unpalatable know. to the ruling party. Let's put it that way. Right. Apparently, because why else were they buried, other than it reflects back on them? Because if you publish something that doesn't give you credit, you know, your, the response from your people that are lecture are saying, well, why aren't you doing something about that? Or what have you done about that? Not so much, why aren't you? Is that a function of, of our, um, because we only have a, a sort of a three-year turnover of governments? Partly that, but greatly to do with apathy. Mm. Yeah. That's you a know, New Zealanders don't demand action, as long yeah. as there's a cold beer and a hot pie and 10 bob on the races. I'm not talking about all New Zealanders. I'm talking about the people that should probably care most, you know. Um, you don't see a lot of action. You see governments saying, well, we'll give money to that or that, or, you know, and are we doing or have we spread it over 27 organizations? Well, yeah, but how about measuring why you gave them the money and what they did with it and what effect it's having, not lining somebody's pocket, you know, somewhere, uh, giving them a job, etc. So all those things need to be examined and, and analyzed and reported. But not, we're not here to castigate and point fingers. We're here to say, well, that's what we've learned. Now, let's have a look at what we think the problems are, because we've got these people to come up and tell their stories. And the third thing is, what's the blueprint that we can take forward? And I'd like to see us come back to the United Nations, who have absolutely castigated us, and, and have our moment at the United Nations to say, here's, we did it with mental health in the 80s. Now, why can't we do it with this? 
Let's take a break there and then okay. we'll come back and we'll chat some more. I'll have a sip of tea then. Yep. <laughs> And welcome back to the program. Our guest on the program today is Sir Owen Glenn. We were talking before the break about um, the Glenn Inquiry uh, and about the research that, that's, that's been going on into it. It feels very much that this is a, a personal crusade for you. No, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I don't have any... I'm not trying to find the Holy Grail. I'm but, not, why, but why are you doing it? Because it's... Well, I mean, because it's, it's such wrong, a huge thing. and it needs to be righted. I mean, that why, sounds why, like a crusade no, no, to no, me. No, that's a good it's a question. <laughs> but why should someone has to stand up for the, those that can't defend themselves, and women and children largely can't mm. defend themselves against physical aggression, etc. I mean, animals can't defend themselves when they're tortured and killed. So it just occurred to me that uh, I could do a lot worse than do this. Uh, We've got a wonderful country you now, and we, we were respected in the world largely, but this, it was um, Dame Sylvia Cartwright, when she retired as Governor General, in a speech said, New Zealand has a dark secret, family violence. It's something we should be facing. Mm. And I read those words and that, I picked up on that and thought, hmm. And I just had occasion to write something this morning that I don't think any minister of social welfare in any government over the last whatever number of decades has had what it takes, one single person, to make the differences that are necessary. But, and I offered a solution, I think there ought to be um, panels of people in areas, you can actually, I did this in India, I went to villages to give you an example, and I said, look, here are all the problems. It's everything from clean water, sewage, you name it, you know, self-sufficiency products and education and health, etc. So I formed village councils and I gave, empowered them with money uh, to make all these differences. And the councils then had to accept the responsibility of doing it. Um, and to give you a crude example of, of, of what, what had to be fixed, we, we rescue these, these children, for instance. We put them through rehab, both mental and physical. Then it breaks in the school year, because I built hostels for them. They send them back to their families. A high percentage of, of them get raped again by their own relatives. So I then said to the village, that's your responsibility. If we send them back, you are charged with looking after their welfare and their health and their, their protection. If not, Glen Family Foundation will replace you because we fund it. Sometimes you've got to do that. Even the Lord used the whip to drive the usurers out of the <laughs> temple, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm interested that the, the common theme I'm sort of getting from you is, is is that you're willing to help and empower, as you, as you mm. say, and, and fund things. But there is also a degree of, of personal responsibility. This is a hand up, not a hand out. And if I can provide some of the solutions in terms of governance or structure, etc., then I will. If I can provide the communication that's necessary with authority, that's my job. But I'm not here to point fingers or, you know, we are all equally guilty. Everybody that may watch this program needs to think hard when they turn the TV down or off. What can I do? What is it that I can do, having watched that? Make me a cup of Milo, dear? Or let me sign up. Let me put my name on the concerned list that we're asking for. Let me add my vote, if you like, if it comes down to that. Mm. And let me see the results of what's happening. I'm not asking for their money, just their conscience and their time. I've noticed in the past in interviews, uh, particularly before the last election, you were very passionate about getting people involved with mm. the political process. That, that, that almost it was as if you were saying it's, it's our responsibility mm. it is. to be involved. Who else? 20% of our people live overseas. No, there's a percentage of people just travelling, backpacking. But there's a high percentage of thinking New Zealanders that have done extremely well overseas. We need those people to remain in touch. We need our people here to want to be involved, not to ignore the subject, that it doesn't affect me. This is not just restricted to one color or culture. But I'm not doing that to upset everybody in, in, in any suburb. I'm just asking that it's recognized as a problem across the spectrum. It's non-political. 
Um, we, we've seen stories in the press that, that there have been some, some funding issues with, with the foundation. Are you going to be able to, oh, to carry it look, off? Look, storming a teacup. That's mischievous <laughs> reporting, for goodness sake. I I give, I've given tens of millions so far, and I haven't said anything to anybody. They just reported things. Yeah. Is that, I mean, is that one of our problems? Look, think that yeah, just cancel your subscription to those media. That <laughs> that and watch out. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. honestly, I have already said many times I'm personally funding the Glen Inquiry. As far as Atara, I have picked and chosen what I think is essential. That's a pilot project. We are still, as of two days ago, I signed uh, eight, eight checks. Yeah. Is that then one of our problems, is, is that we have a media that's, that's always, always looking to, to, to pick up on things, to, to expand on things that maybe aren't... Well, I spoke to the Vice Chancellor of the University. I said, we should start a chair, which I'm willing to fund in journalism. This country critically needs that. Have you always had this, this heart for compassionate projects? Yes. I, mean, I, I, I never hit anybody in my life, not even on the rugby field. And Kiwis are generally compassionate, nice, fair people. Yeah, we'll, we know how to mix it on the paddock. But once we leave the paddock, let's have a beer and let's have a chat. You know, we, we're not lacking good people. We're lacking good leadership. You've, you've uh, dabbled isn't the right word, but, but you have supported political parties in yeah. the past. Uh, but you, now you're not anymore. You've decided not to. No. Are our politicians not up to it? Basically, I think we can do a lot better. And in the process of, of picking politicians, I think the New Zealand public should educate itself better. And, and frankly, the media should play an important part in that. Because, you know, people have an obligation to educate themselves on the issues. But the, poli the political candidates are very clever. They just work on what the local issues are to, to get a vote. And in that situation, it falls down. Because that somehow there has to be a process of bringing up the issues. Uh, and there's not one. There's all sorts of issues. There's mining, there's exports, there's uh, the fact that New Zealand's bankrupt, technically. You know, we owe so much money. If it wasn't our GDP and our ability to find, uh, meet the loans eventually, but is this what we want to do? Is this how we want to live? And uh, yeah, so should we choose better on more issues? Yes, and get better people to stand, because in the end, whoever's elected forms the basis for somebody to form a government and 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 elect a cabinet. I mean. So you have a look at all these people in cabinet. What do they really know about their own cabinet issues, mm. let alone the others? So it comes down to one man in the end that they elect to say, OK, you're the boss, you tell us. And how much time can any one man give? Well, whichever colour he's from, it doesn't matter. You know, They're not all bad people. Um, Are you were quoted as, as saying, I think it was just before the last election, you said that that the government hadn't actually done much. It, it, it was, um, it hadn't come up, it had done some, you know, said some nice things, but it hadn't come up with an action plan to deal with the fact that basically we were living beyond our means. Do, yeah. uh, has that changed? Not in my opinion. No, it hasn't changed. And I said that in front of the Prime Minister at the forum we had, um, uh, round table business forum. I raised the question, I said, where's the blueprint? after three years. Well, what, are we, what are we trying to do? Pay off the debt? What, what are we trying to do? Um, and I didn't, we didn't get a favourable answer. We just said, well, you know, people in New Zealand will judge what sort of job we do. Well, one day I probably will remind them of that. <laughs> do you know we're the second biggest, the wealthiest country in the world per capita of what resources we have under our seabeds and, and soil after Saudi Arabia? Billions. Yeah, we're the second biggest Brilliant. in the world. I'm not suggesting we, you know, have open cast mining in the domain. <laughs> but 150 kilometres offshore, if there's whatever there is there we want, and whose view are we impairing? Yeah. You know, and naturally they have to have the safeguards, which are expensive to put in, but that's what the wor world re revolves around. If you don't want petrol in your car and you want to go back to horses, yeah, okay, you don't need oil. I don't say anything outrageous, I just look at something and say, well, why can't we think of doing this a little differently? Or, Because 
like our present government manages by daily poll. Mm. If we were running with a positive balance sheet, looking after all the people that do require our attention and benefits and everything, that's fine. And we're a healthy country and we provide a good standard of living. That's about it. You know, that's not a hard thing, is it? And it, everybody would be happier. It has been a joy to talk to you. So, Owen, thank you so much for joining us. You're on giving up on me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> thank you, Owen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alan Lee talking there with businessman and philanthropist Sir Owen Glenn. And he's keen to have your feedback on the projects he's doing. So if you log on to glenninquiry.org, again that website is glenninquiry.org, then you can add your comments and feedback. Thank you.